Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bianca Durani, President and CEO of Aperio Philanthropy. Aperio is a nonprofit fundraising consulting firm. So day to day, our job is to work alongside purpose-driven nonprofits to generate sustainable revenue growth. But really, the reason that we exist is to unleash the power of communities to drive change in our societies. We believe that nonprofit organizations are an important tool for social justice, environmental justice, um, and community well-being. And we're really excited to be part of today's conversation about an organization that's focusing on another important area for change um, in education. We've been partnering with uh, NYU's School of Professional Studies for a few years on these events, and we're just so thrilled to be advancing the conversation about what does the role of philanthropy of nonprofits look like going forward as we reimagine how we work together to drive change. Today's conversation is going to focus on how a funder and a founder can collaborate to get a new initiative or organization off the ground. And I just want to thank our panelists and moderator and co-host in advance. But first, I'll turn it over to Michelle D'Amico from NYU. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Bianca. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle D'Amico, and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs or CGA. Since its founding, our goal at the Center for Global Affairs has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through a variety of activities, including our two graduate programs, one in global affairs and another MS in global security, conflict, and cybercrime. We also offer a wide variety of skills and knowledge-based continuing education courses and offer public events such as this that expand upon the critical topics covered in our classrooms. We are very proud to be home to the George H. Heyman Jr. Program for Fundraising and Philanthropy. Through our open enrollment courses and certificate in fundraising, we offer professionally oriented educational options for those looking to grow within or enter the fundraising field. Courses are taught by practitioner faculty who bring their vast experience, expertise, and networks to the classroom, including today's moderator, Liz Nganzi. We'll send out a follow-up message to all attendees, so please feel free to reach out with any questions you might have. Now, I'm really delighted to introduce you to today's moderator. Professor Nganzi is the founder and CEO of the International Social Impact Institute and an adjunct assistant professor here within the Heyman program. Liz joined our faculty in 2009 and has been a dedicated faculty member developing and teaching courses that empower working professionals to leverage emerging technologies for effective stakeholder engagement. Her exceptional teaching abilities have been recognized with the NYU SPS 2021 Teaching Excellence Award. Liz, very happy to turn this virtual floor over to you and our wonderful panelists. Thank you so very much. Hello, everyone, uh, for wherever you may be today. It's so wonderful to have you with us. Um, and for those of you who are watching the recording, settle in for an insightful conversation. Uh, thank you, of course, Michelle and Bianca. I'm really honored to have this opportunity to guide this critical conversation. Um, and folks who you know are joining us, please make sure to share your questions in the chat so we can address them during the open Q&A portion of the program. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, anyone who's fundraised knows the first gift is always the hardest to secure. It can be daunting to make the case for a new big idea and ask for support of a vision before it's realized. On the funding side, funders and philanthropists hear about so much important work every single day. There are always more great ideas to fund. So the question is, when does it make sense to take the leap on a new organization or initi a new initiative? Today's conversation will explore how founders and funders can collaborate to get a new venture off the ground. Looking at the case study of the founding of the Surge Institute and the in instrumental early support of the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Philanthropies, we will examine what productive partnerships look like and what it can accomplish for our communities. We'll begin by discussing what these initial conversations were like, then we'll discuss what advice our panelists would give to founders looking to fund their startup nonprofit or initiative and funders interested in, in supporting early stage ideas. So uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel. Let's start with our founder, Carmita Saman, who is the founder and CEO of the Surge Institute. Um, after starting her career as an engineer 
and strategist for multiple Fortune 500 companies, including Procter & Gamble and Danaher, corporate America could not contain Carmita's desire to lead initiatives that benefit youth and transform urban communities. So she blazed a trail within the nonprofit sector, primarily in the K through 12 urban education. Carmita's expertise is supporting and elevating the genius of emerging and seasoned leaders, particularly women and people of color, and shining a light on the brilliance and ingenuity that is so often overlooked and untapped in solving systemic issues. Her guiding principle is the connection of head, heart, and soul in leadership to drive sustainable impact and lasting partnerships. Now let's turn it over to or learn about our funder, Julie Makuda, is co-president of the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Philanthropies and leads their K-12 education portfolio. In this capacity, she oversees their strategy and investments in increasing the number of low-income students, especially students of color, who graduate from high school ready for college and the workplace. Julie joined the organization in 2013 to build their education portfolio and team. So now let's hear directly from our panelists. Carmita, can you tell us the story of how you got the idea for the Surge Institute what, and what led you to decide to found the organization? Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Yes, um, Surge was really born out of my impatience and a bit of frustration. Um, I was haunted when I entered education um, by two things. One was a lack of representation of the communities that were being served at tables where their fates were being decided. And the other was a lack of intentionality around talent acceleration that disproportionately impacted women and folks of color. As you mentioned in, in my bio, I transitioned into education in the early 2000s from um, a, non, a, a corporate background. I worked as a chemical engineer. So I, I share that because I was used to being one of the only in lots of rooms, but I was haunted because when I, I made the decision to work in education, because frankly, education and access to a high quality public education um, was my pathway out of poverty. I was haunted by the fact that even in those spaces, we were suffering from the same thing that I had seen in corporate where the people who were being served were often their voices, their assets, their brilliance were not represented at tables. Um, and there wasn't any great intentionality around how to ensure that people were prepared for promotion, senior role, so that they could actually thrive and drive systemic change once they got to those positions. So Surge is really a response to both of those things. And I love the name. <laughs> I think you. it's great. And I think research has so many different things, but it's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And Julie, please tell us about your journey in philanthropy and your role at the Shusman Family Philanthropies, please. Yes, thank you. And thank you for having me here. It's such an honor to be here beside Carmita, especially. She's Everybody will know at the end of this uh, conversation how amazing a leader she is and has been since I first met her. Um, so I came into philanthropy uh, um, actually after having some really intense jobs. I was on the school board in Washington, D.C. and also on the leadership team simultaneously of a national education nonprofit. And I had just had a baby. So I actually joined philanthropy as a way to kind of take the pedal off the gas a little bit because I thought, OK, this is going to be not as intense. Um, and I can have a more you know, balanced life. Um, and uh, I've really learned that it's such an incredible field. It's super intellectually challenging. There are challenges we'll talk about today, but it, I kind of got in and, and got stuck uh, there. Like I got the bug, right? Um, especially because as philanthropy, you can think about systems level work, which is where I knew I gravitated towards. At the Schusterman Found Foundation, as you said, I lead, I co uh, I'm a co-president. We have this odd structure. I lead our education work. We also invest heavily in criminal justice, gender reproductive equity, um, voting and democracy, as well as supporting Jewish leadership and protecting Israel as a safe democracy. And so I'm one of a group of people, many of whom in the US are focused on racial equity matters, but also international. Um, and so it's been a real pleasure to be able to be a part of, a, an, of an evolving organization. Like Carmita, I joined when all we were doing was Tulsa, the hometown Tulsa work and education, and it's grown. Wow. So I wanna ask, did you ever get that balance? You said you took your foot off the pedal. I'm imagining that didn't happen. I'm going to say it like 
there is a different balance and I will always be like what Carmita does every day in her days yeah. are going to yeah. be much longer and more intense than most of mine. And I totally respect that. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, okay. So let's just dive right into how the relationship began. Um, Carmita, you know, how did you, how did your relationship begin with them? How did you get the conversation started? Um, you know, I, I, it's, always great to hear how one sort of takes that step obviously you're very brave you're quite bold so I think that wasn't hard for you but we'd love to hear from you so I'll start by saying that um you know though I am the founder of Surge I am not the only one that um that helped to get this off the ground and I think um, you know, that was really critical, even in forming the right relationships with potential funding partners. So in the early days, um, I knew that I had an idea, but I also wasn't arrogant enough to believe that I had the best idea. <laughs> so I sought counsel um, from a lot, from a wide network of folks. And I say this particularly for your student listeners um, I was able to tap into that network because it had grown organically. Um, I wasn't actively out seeking to, you know, build connections with people to help me start a thing. I had already organically built those relationships through the work, through the things that I had done over the years. So when I had this idea, I was able to call on people um, who would push me, who would challenge me, who would say, no, nah, girl, that ain't right. <laughs> like there were, there were <laughs> absolutely those folks. And that was really critical in helping me develop the relationship with Schusterman. I had two um, I had three folks who had agreed to be um, on my initial board of directors. Two of those individuals had very close relationships with Schusterman and were willing to sort of drop my name and help make a professional um, connection there uh, at the time. And Julie, I had to go back and look at my notes. I'm like, so did I? <laughs> looking at emails from like 2013 and 14 yeah. we were exchanging. Um, and the program officer at that time at Schusterman was also someone that I had known professionally uh, in my work in education. So while it was, um, you know, some might consider it bold or, you know, I in many ways felt comfortable going to these folks because there had already been sort of warm introductions made. Now, obviously it was my job to sort of take that warm introduction and then run with it. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that I had board members and others who I learned later who were folks I had worked for and alongside who were willing to sort of pick up the phone and say, hey, Julie, this is worth a phone call or this is worth a conversation, um, that, that was invaluable. Absolutely. No, I love that because what I'm hearing is the value of the warm, the, the the warm call, right? Not the cold call, but the warm call. But even more importantly, the value of developing organic relationships with people so that when the com time comes, when you need a sponsor, they show up. Right? Exactly. That's, so that's that's what I'm hearing. And I think that's so important because we don't re recognize enough uh, uh, the, the value of that. So, um, okay, thanks for sharing that. So now, Julie, it's been said that funders fun based on the leader as much as based on the idea. What sparked your interest in Carmita and the Surge Institute? So um, I, I went back and looked at those same emails uh, that Carmita saw, and it was both Carmita's that she was known to a member of our team. Her leadership had been uh, on display. Folks knew her as a leader. Other people, to your point, Carmita, validated Carmita's idea and um, and said, she's been working, this is not a fly by night. This is someone who's gonna take this idea, stick with it. She's already been through various iterations of it. She's gonna work this out because early stage organizations, I often think what it, what the idea looks like on day one is not what the organization is gonna look like on year one, honestly. And that's great because that just means someone's in there kind of iterating it. But if you have that passion and drive to make, make the, the vision come to life in some way, it's gonna happen. And so we kind of knew that Carmita was gonna be that person um, she also, this is another part of the relationships. Um, the, my colleague was a, had been a Broad resident. I had been leader of alumni uh, Teach for America. And so we saw the value inherently of building long-term leadership and what it takes uh, to create long-term leaders. And so we saw that need. 
Um, and Carmita was coming at it from a very different angle. She was very intentionally saying, I'm not going for the TFAers. I'm not going for Broads. I'm going for people of color who nobody has heard about. And yet they are the leaders we need to be investing in. And it was a major gap in our space. And I will say this, it's also at the time when we were kind of done with fellowships because they're too expensive per person. But we said, wow, this is this one has to happen. Um, and Carmita, as you said, I think something around, you wanted to change the face of decision makers in education. And honestly, we were stuck in education. I feel like we were plateauing. So all of these things combined to say Carmita was the right leader and had this idea that really met a big gap in the, at the time. Right, so the right leader who had done her homework, validated the idea, nurtured the relationship. So by the time it was presented to you, it's likely, you know, even though you may have been thinking about other things or it's switch strategies, this seemed very viable. So I think that's wonderful. Now I'm bringing it back to Carmita. Okay. Tell us about those first meetings with Julie and her team and, you know, how'd you prepare? How'd the meetings go? Did you, how'd you follow up? All that, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, people taking notes, they need to know like what you do. What's the blueprint? Well, I obviously did my homework. So I knew what they funded, who they funded. Um, those kind of things. Not that that was, to be quite honest, not that that was very helpful to me because we didn't really fit within um, their current strategy at the time. But the thing that I loved um, about Julie and Michelle uh, Boyers at the time was that they didn't pretend that we fit. Like it, it was, they were very honest at the front that said like, hey, this is interesting to us for all the reasons that Julie mentioned We've, we're more focused on teachers, but we do recognize that we've reached this plateau. So we'll hear you out, you know, kind of thing. So I had done my homework. I understood uh, what I was coming into, which felt a, like a bit of an uphill battle. Um, but I also had done enough of the work. And this wasn't, again, this is where I have to shout out all the people who had supported me. I had a, an amazing advi advisory group who had torn apart my early idea and poked holes in lots of things so that when I came into those early conversations, and this is this is a lesson that I think a lot of um, early stage funders should hear, is I talked about it as if the thing already existed. Like I, I legitimately had a program plan. I had early evaluation plan. I had a budget. Um, and it, I, there was nothing. It was just me at my dining room table. And I think that that's important. Like, I think it's really important to um, like speak a thing into existence. If you don't believe it, then you're, they certainly will not believe it. Um, so I'd like to think that that helped as well. And then finally, I'll say, um, I wasn't afraid for folks not to not to completely understand or get why I saw this as part of the solution. So what I'll say about that is often the more proximate you are to a thing, the more difficult it will be for other people to understand the significance or importance of that thing because they aren't necessarily living it. So I had, you know, lived being a woman of color in this space. Um, I had lived, frankly, not just being a woman of color, but a woman, I was, I was one of our kids. I grew up in housing projects. I had experienced homelessness and all of these things. I came in with a, you know, maybe inappropriate amount of confidence that that gave me like some inside information um, that would be really helpful. So I think um, all of those things were really significant in getting the, like not only getting those early meetings and hopefully impressing them, but also showing up as exactly who I was in a way that wasn't about, you know, pretending and, you know, it was, uh, and I, I really believe that that helped the the or, um, organic nature of the relationship that set laid the groundwork for it to continue through this day. I love that. And so it's act as if, but be authentic, right? That's those are the two pieces, right? You've got to balance that. But there is one thing you shared on the call that I thought was really smart. You remember you talked about the, um, I think it was the, the founder who you spoke with um, and the research you did, because I think it's important for people to know that you did this so they can think about the, how to apply that in their own context. 
Yeah. So for context, I will say this was after we had gotten the grant, right? So I don't know that I would have had an opportunity to have a meeting with Stacey Schusterman if they hadn't already said yes. <laughs> so, um, but the very first um, funding that we received and Julie will nod and agree with this. They, it was very clear. It was a one-time grant. It was sort of like, okay, we're placing a bet on you. Uh, we'll see how this works, but don't get your hopes up about any future funding. They were very transparent about it. Um, and the principal, Stacy Schusterman, was someone that um, want, was on the board of one of my other board members. So I was able to leverage that relationship to get a meeting. So that's, again, another, uh, nobody off the street is just calling up Stacey Schusterman to get a meeting. So I was able to leverage that relationship. And I had done my homework and I knew that Stacy and I shared a background in engineering and specifically in operations. So when you've been on manufacturing floors and operations floors, it's very different than the engineer in the lab and those sorts of things. So when I had a an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her to sort of pitch the idea, um, early on, I didn't really think that she was absorbing all of my talk about education equity and racial injustice. Um, intellectually, I thought she got it, but I didn't, I didn't see any passion bubbling up. So I pivoted that conversation and started talking about our experience our experiences as women is in engineering, a male dominated field and how other that environment can be, othering in that environment can be and the impact that it has on a woman who is told that she has to be less of herself in order to be successful. And I bridge that connection to this is what folks of color are often feeling in this space that is so you know necessary to the state of our democracy. The education of young people is absolutely the future of this country. And I saw this light bulb go off for her and it was like, ah, hadn't thought about that connection. Um, and I would never take credit if Stacey has been an amazing um, just supporter and advocate of ours since. And I wouldn't take credit for any of the work that they have done to sort of establish um, the Schusterman family philanthropies as, as really a leader. But that was a moment for me as a founder where I'm like, ah, it isn't, it's about finding those points of connection yes. and getting people, bringing people along with you versus hammering them over the head with some stuff that they may or may not understand. Which is reframing the way we think, right? Because oftentimes we're coming with our idea, what's why it's important to us or the communities we're serving, but we really need to be able to contextualize it for the funder or the prospective partner so that it makes sense in their context and that they, you can get that sort of connect. Like you said, she got intellectually, but the heart connection happened. Absolutely. Um, and so right from there. So thank you. So I want to ask you the first budget that you, you indicated was a million dollars. Most people would be like, I mean, it'd be nice if it gives 50,000 or something like that. So just have to decide that this is where I'm going to share and I'm going to go ahead and, and boldly, <laughs> uh, and I, I won't use the word bold, but go ahead and, and, and decide to share this number with, with that. I think a lot of people would be uncomfortable sharing. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this short because I really want to hear Julie's reaction. <laughs> um, but here was the thing, I um, I wanted to present what it would really take in order to make this happen, mm -hmm. and through a lot of just life experiences, um, I've always uh, you know the refrain that's always in my head is to teach people how to treat you. And my thing was, if I go in with some like nickel and dime, like holding stuff together with a shoestring, then that's what I'm presenting to them is how I think about this organization. And that, I just didn't want to do that. I was, I thought, if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail on my own terms. It's not going to be because I went ahead and, you know, uh, said <laughs> said no before I gave them an opportunity to. So um, while some folks thought it was bold, I thought 
there's no way I'm going to, you know, do this halfway. That's just not how I operate. So I don't want to present something to them, let them walk it back, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. and, but I I don't want to do that for them. Um, And I think that that's something, and, you know, obviously you talked about, I, I had been in leadership. I led a national nonprofit um, before. And so I had seen, I had examples um, sure. from others. There was, uh, I'll, I'll, I'd never speak her name. So I should say I had the opportunity um, when I was the chief um, um, strategy officer at America's Promise Alliance to work with a CEO, Marguerite Kondracki. And that woman I just being a fly on the wall watching her fundraise was something really critical to me because she never made a small ask. I mean, she would go into a meeting no thinking that someone really only had maybe 500,000 to give and she would ask for 5 million. Mm-hmm. Um and there is something about seeing that modeled for you um and thinking, well, why can't I do the same? So No, that's that's wonderful. Julie, what did you think? So she comes to you Idea is great. Founder's great. So we need a million dollars. <laughs> so this is fat. So uh, I thought, okay. I mean, I thought I'd not think, okay, I'm going to write here. Now let's write a check for a million dollars. But what I thought yeah. is this is someone who's thought this through. Yes. Right? It actually was a check in the confidence column, if you will, because she wasn't saying I'm going to string this together. She wasn't saying I'm not going to pay myself until I raise funds. She was saying, this is going to be, it's going to, in order to do this well, it's going to take some money. Now, she also didn't come in with 5 million. And I've also found that I've experienced that. And then I think, mm, nope, like that, th- it was kind of a sweet spot to say right. a million sounds like something that you need in order to get this organization off the ground where you need it to go. Right. So it actually boosted my confidence a little bit about this person understands how to think through the, the uh, operation of an organization. As to this idea that she said, we've got a we're going to learn as we go. We're going to be a continuous learning organization from the beginning. She mentioned, Carmita, you mentioned like, okay, we had evaluation built in because, you know, these things, this was a hard thing to measure the impact. And I don't think that we should over dial on measuring impact, but just the idea of like, okay, I'm going to come back and I'm going to have more impact. And then I'll say to Carmita's point, yeah, we send all kinds of signals. This is one and done. And I feel like this is what, um, as a funder, I think clarity is equity, Right. And in this case, like I like to get conversations, you know, yes, this is a possible or no, it's possible very quickly, not drag it out for six months or a year, but also just say like, I think this is going to be a one-year grant, one-time grant rather than string you along again. I'd rather come back at the back end and say, actually, we can expand this, right? So, uh, but I wasn't particularly thrown off. I was like, okay, that sounds like a a reasonable ask for what you want to do. Okay. I love that. Sure, go ahead. I had one thing um, because Julie, something that you touched on, um, I just, you know, we said coming into this conversation, we were going to pull the curtain all the way back. So I think it's important, particularly for those who are leading small startups or thinking about them. Um, something Julie said uh, was something I didn't say, but I had planned on doing, which was, I did not lower the salary that I asked for in my budget at all. I had been a CEO of another nonprofit. So I took a haircut off of that because it's like, obviously, but I didn't lower it to like some really small level. Now, what I didn't say to the funder is I'm not actually going to pay myself that (laughs) until I raise this million dollars, but I didn't change the budget at all. So, because what you'll find is, you know, Julie's not going to went when we're auditing and giving updates, Julie's not going through to see how much did she pay herself this quarter or that sort of thing. So in the early days, I paid other people more than I paid myself because I knew that there were things that we needed to invest in, marketing, evaluation, those sorts of things. But I never changed the dollar amount on the budget because it was important to me as a signal to say, here's what I know that I'm worth. Um, and I want you to know that I know that, but if I have to do some things behind the scenes to take care of my people, to make other investments, then I'll, you know, once we, we actually raise this full million dollars, I'll make myself whole on the back end. Um, so I just want to say that because I think too often in these conversations, we don't get behind the how, um, of making these things happen. So I just offer that to anyone who's listening for whom it might be helpful. 
I love that. And people need to remember his mantra, know your value, know what you're worth, you know, um, and, and, go back and, and teach things? people how to treat you. Yeah. Please um, go ahead. Absolutely. Both of y'all talked about a little bit, but I just want to, I, I just want to like lift this up as well. Carmita, you walked up both Stacy and Michelle and I across a bridge, right? Like you came with an idea that to your point, you could see the need for in a way that I couldn't. Right. But you didn't say, you got to trust me, fund me. You said, and even with Stacy, you said, I'm going to find a way to get you to come as close to understanding this um, as possible. And I think sometimes the, my experience is different. It's, you know, just trust. I see something you don't, tr I don't see. Okay. Uh, and I see this all, all the time with like early stage. And it's not that I don't believe it. It's just that I can't support and take something to Stacy right. that I can't define why this is good stewardship of her funds, right. right? So in order for me to be an advocate and an ally to an amazing leader, I have to be able to break through that and be able to understand the concept and the idea enough to be able to do what I need internally uh, as, a, as a funder. No, absolutely. I, I love that. So let's then segue into what Carmia has done well to advance the relationship that other nonprofit leaders and um, fundraisers can learn from, right? Because obviously you said one and done. We started one and done. Yeah. And this relationship has continued. So there's something beyond, you know, the, the, obviously the, the, the initiation of the relationship was very strong, but what has she done to really maintain and advance that relationship? Well, so we, uh, so much, you know, there's just so much. So A, over time as we got to know Carmita, like, we have, we, like every other organization in the world, have core values and we are looking for an alignment and yeah, of core values. And ours are equity, impact, optimism, collaboration, and humility. And I just saw that embodied in Carmita and the programs that she was creating. I kept hearing back informally how transformative the, the programs were for people who were going through them um, and experiencing the Surge Fellowship. Uh, so you could hear that. I also, frankly, saw that Carmita was still not hit, not able to like attract all the funding that I think she needed. And so we wanted to stay in as a signal to other funders to this is somebody to back. Right. Um, and so like we just need a little bit more. Maybe we need a little bit more time than just one two year grant to until other people see what's happening that and Carmita's work might be more aligned with strategy. Carmita was one of my go to's when COVID broke out. I was like, you know. What's happening? What are you seeing? How are your folks doing? What's And so there just became, look, there's going to be expertise on both sides and a real partnership on both sides. We are, our success is interdependent, yeah. right? And Carmita has been somebody that I can turn to um, in various uh, time, uh, and times. And then it's even led to um, some other great program uh, uh, collaboration. So there's just been kind of a openness and flexibility, I think, on both sides, but it started with some pretty, I think, candid communication. Carmen, yeah. what would you say? Yeah. How about, what, is, what would you say, and what has this relationship meant to you, right? I mean, because this is a transformative relationship, it sounds like. Oh, absolutely. I mean, 100%. it is, you know, if you think about it, um, we have been a consistent grantee of um, Schusterman since December of 2014. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of unheard of, you know, especially for an organization of our size. Um, we're not direct service to um, students. Like there are all these, all these characteristics of what we do that for some people say makes it more difficult for them to fund or pitch or those sorts of things. Um, so it's been transformational just, you know, just upon that, um, you know, that consistency. But to, to pick up what Julie mentioned, what that consistency has signaled to others has been really invaluable. I've had other, you know, Julie doesn't always know that I know when she's talking to other funders on our behalf, but it'll get back to me where it's like, oh yeah, I talked to so-and-so and, you know, and it's, it's, um, you know, I've had other funders say to me, I'll, I'll never forget this woman. And I so value and appreciate that. She said to me, she said, you know, Carmita, I hear about Surge. I hear about you everywhere, but I don't believe that your revenue matches your reputation. Um, and it was a powerful, it, 
I had felt it, but to have someone who was on the other side of the check writing say to me, I, I feel this. Um, and, you know, she was like, it's actually up to those of us who really know the transformational systemic work that you're doing to ensure that we're out here telling others as well. And that's something that I've absolutely felt from Julie and her team, even Stacy, I'll never forget. And it was about 2017. She was on stage in a room full of philanthropists and she talked about surge. She didn't have to do that. <laughs> like she just volunteered volunteered um, that. And I would say, you know, Julie, and she talked about the candor, um, neither of us are afraid to be candid with each other. You know, mm -hmm. we were going through a strategic planning process a couple of years ago. Uh, we had partnered with a firm. It was going a little shaky. Mm -hmm. And Julie reached out to say like, hey, uh, excuse me, <laughs> like, I trust you. I believe in you, but I think you need to know something, you know, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that um, we can get that kind of critical feedback. And I didn't at any moment think that that meant that our relationship was at risk. It was, hey, I'm deeply invested mm -hmm. in you doing everything that you need to do in order to thrive for the leaders that you invest in. Therefore, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Um, right. And, and you know, I've done some similar things on the end when I've seen things happening in the field and in the spaces where it's like, oh, this feels off. I'm not one that sends one message to my black and brown friends and then another message. To, it's like, no, I'm going to say the thing. Um, and I just believe that even if people don't understand or don't necessarily agree, there is something that is so binding yeah. and organic about building relationship based on like you, who you are and being authentic. And that has absolutely been my lived experience with um, Julie and the entire team at Schusterman. I, I, I think I agree with the, that this is so important. And the two things that I get from this, like to summarize it for folks are one, understand that it's really important to create a mutually beneficial relationship, mm -hmm. right? That looks at, because you need to also add value to, to your funding partner uh, because that's then how they also become your, your sponsor, right? So, I mean, of course you are good stewards and, and all of that, but but the nurturing that relationship and being of value to them is also the reason why someone steps up and says, hey, let me tell you about this organization or, you know, serves as a, sort of a, a vouchers for you. So very important to know that that can come out of the relationship beyond that initial check or those checks that are that, that people are, are folks are writing. So love it. Um, I'm going to now switch over a little bit because I feel like the conversation we had, we talked about how it's important to ground this conversation in this current moment we're living in, right? Um, I don't, I'm pretty sure that everybody on this call um, can relate, but let me just go ahead and, and set up the question. So just zooming out a bit, I think, it, you know, I think we're going through a moment in fundraising and philanthropy. So for those of us who've been attending these events, the NYU Aperio events for a while, know that a lot of the conversations have focused on this paradox that our nonprofit and philanthropy sector is on one hand rooted in systemic racism and on the other is best our best hope for change, right? Just being super transparent. Uh, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, we saw a surge in um, interest uh, and funding for the work of anti-racism, social justice, and equity. Today, that support is dwindling, quite frankly. So Carmita, let's ask you, you know, how do you understand our current moment and what has it been like for you as a nonprofit leader, you know, color, and what do you see going forward? Yeah. Um, oh man, we could spend a whole, I know that's a whole, whole that's this. a whole, whole conversation. I will, I will try to, I will try to sum it up. I will one say, I will acknowledge that surge absolutely was, um, and is a beneficiary of, what I call the the uh, awakening that many folks had, you know, post George Floyd. Yeah. Um, I went from having to explain to people why surge needed to exist to having people, you know, reach out to say, "Oh goodness, can you support us? Can you support our teams? Can you do, you know, all of those sorts of things?" Um, and at the time. When people ask me, I always said that I was only cautiously optimistic mm -hmm. about that moment. Um, and it's because I've lived my whole 46 years in this skin, right? <laughs> like, yeah. so my thing was, um, 
I am hopeful that this sort of energy and all those sorts of things will sustain, but there are so many signals that tell me that this is a moment in time, not a new movement. Um, I think that that's what we're seeing now in this retraction of lots of sort of funding and interest in issues specifically related to, you know, equity, um, DEIB and those sorts of things. Um, We are feeling that pinch as an organization Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I have to acknowledge the privilege that we have of not feeling it to the same extent as a number of peer organizations and particularly much smaller organizations Mm -hmm. because we're roughly a, you know, 7.6, $7.7 million organization. Um, We are facing a future deficit in 2025, but I think we were, we were intentional about not growing as fast as we could have when all the, when the big checks started coming in, mm-hmm. um, that was a strategic decision. That's that smart. We made. Um, you know, here I tell people, I wouldn't change anything about the way I grew up. I I've been poor before. I know what it feels like. <laughs> so it was like, let us make sure we have healthy reserves. Yeah. Let's start making some investment. We absolutely did expand our team and did some investment in human capital, but we saw that as a lot of R&D investment to really support what we were doing moving forward. So that that's the surge experience. I am um I am uh really saddened honestly about what I see as this very hard pivot away by um, some funders, it almost feels like not only just around issues of equity, um, but just in education philanthropy more broadly, there's kind of this like, we've tried all these things over the past 20 years, nothing is working, like let's pivot Mm -hmm. to whatever the next shiny thing is. Um, And I think it is really, um, I think those of us who are in the work have to take every opportunity that we can Mm -hmm. um, to really sort of rally against that, to use Mm -hmm. the positions of access, privilege, power that we have to really fight against that. And I mean, for me, I just have to keep doing what we do. Like Mm -hmm. I have to keep investing in our people because I believe at my core that the ingenuity and innovation of those people who have shared experience with our students and family is what is, that's what's going to drive systemic change. And I can't let the externalities in any way allow that conviction to waver. Uh, That's really well said. And the good news is um, we have the article that you shared, uh, the uh, the interview that you did in the 74. We'll include that in the follow-up materials I read. And I think it's wonderful. And it really dives in deeper to this conversation for those who want uh, to learn more. Um, Julie, let's hear from you, from your perspective on the funding side on uh, recent trends in philanthropy. And what do you hope to see going forward? Yeah, no, nothing that Camita says surprises me, unfortunately. Yeah. It saddens me. Yeah. Um, I think, I lo- I've been thinking a lot about this because I have been seeing this pullback and I'm trying to figure out to Carmita's point, like how do I use my position of privilege and power and access to ne- re-steer some of us into going back to and adding towards uh, more funds de- dedicated to leaders of color and to issues based in equity. I think there's a couple of things as I've been thinking about it that have come to mind. One is, um, you know, I, th- I think about philanthropy as being a spoke on the wheel. I-, I ride a bike a lot, right? And so all the spokes have to be true. You can't have any broken spokes. Um, but we're one spoke on the wheel and our organizations are the other spokes on the wheel. We can't get from A to B unless all the spokes are true and turning. Like we are interdependent, right? Mm-hmm. But there's a wheel right? Like, so we have our strategy, we have our systems, we have our goals, right? After George Floyd's murder, there was a goal of folks saying we are committed to racial equity. And Mm -hmm. so this work fit into that goal. It is very, so then I'm kind of trying to think about what's the version 2.0 of this narrative, right? And as funders, how do we elevate the version 2.0? So for example, something like Surge, we all know there's too much turnover in, in schools, all the way from schools, all the way up through the entire apparatus that is a school district. And I think organizations like Carmita's are solutions to that, right? And I see a lot of funders trying to figure out how we're solving this. So how do you, how do we tap, 
everything from like AI, why is AI not penetrating largely and as as fast in organ and communities of color? And yeah. I know that there's some, you know, hesitation that's specific to communities of color about like privacy issues and other things for very good reasons and histor historical context around uh, what government does to information and how it's how it is can be used against communities of color. So who's going to go? Who's going to be the bridge to the to communities of color as we think about using AI to totally get all of the value to teachers and to students? So there's different ways to think about what's the version 2.0 to pull in to to re-trigger this idea that investing in leaders of color is going to help us to achieve the goals that we want to see in the world. Um, and it's going to have to be bigger and more nuanced than um, we are now recommitted to racial equity because racial equity is what everybody's committed to. It's going to be something that's more nuanced. But I think that funders have to play a role in helping to look ourselves in the mirror and then catalyze with each other that work. Absolutely. I agree with you. And with respect to that conversation about AI and communities of color, I just spoke this earlier this week in uh, the 10th annual conference of uh, Silicon Harlem. So it's an organization that is bringing um, access to uh, communities of color in Harlem um, around technology. And really what I what I found is that the, 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 the big issue, of course, privacy issues, but it's also just demystifying. Mm -hmm. There's so much rhetoric about how it's so complicated and so all of this, but like it's about making more accessible uh, and, and so that people can really understand how it can be applied in their lives and make a difference. And it's a real game changer. So I just wanted to plug Thank that because that. that's what yeah. I teach. Yeah. So that's why I'm interested in saying that. But my my question, the questions are on fire. So I'm just jumping right into the questions that I um, we had and we may come back to my own, but I want to make sure that we answer those that were provided to us. So Julie, we're going to, I'm just going to leave you right here as you're here. How has your work with Carmita and Surge impacted your work with other nonprofit partners? Um, so I think working with every single time you work with a leader, you're learning something, right? And I think with Carmita and Surge specifically, um, I think thinking about what are the what are the what are the thing what are the uh, supports that specifically leaders of color need, and how that might how might that look different than just kind of a generic approach to supporting leaders in education? And so that's definitely impacted both we we, we bring to other organizations that do not have a focus specifically on leaders of color, and also how we might be listening to other organizations that are focused on developing leaders of color. It just helps us to be better informed as we think about this whole dynamic of talent pipelines and promotions and the and the culture of schools that need to be that uh, that are most successful for adult, adults as well as children. Okay, all right, wonderful. Uh, thank you for sharing that. So then I, Carmita, I'm gonna to come to you on this one. I think Julie, you can probably chime in, but let's go with Carmita first. Can you offer any additional tips for keeping funders and fundraisers uh, in a mutually beneficial relationship for the long term? right? So. Yeah. Nothing so short term first, but what are some other things that people can learn? Because I, I'm like, I feel I should have my pen or, you know, just go on. <laughs> um, I, I will tell you. Um, so some of this is I am a relationship person. It's just who I am. Like, um, so some of this is very organic for me. And it I found that it makes it difficult for me to try to tell folks exactly what to do because, you know, when you just do a thing, but it has been helpful to have people around me who will say, hey, this thing that you're doing, not everyone does that. So I'll, I asked um, around to get some insight. So one is I communicate often, um, probably too much sometimes, but um, not just around grant periods or whatever. It's, it's important to me that you're letting funders um, feel like they're a part of what's happening in the organization. So that's beyond just the formal grant reports and those sorts of things, but like, if we have some major news that comes out, you know, we, um, the Kansas City superintendent is now a Surge alum. That was a huge deal. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, fire off a text to Julie. Like it doesn't, I'm not waiting for some, you know, opportunity to make some big, you know, speech or whatever. Um, so I think just keeping those lines of communication and humanizing the funders, like they are human beings who have interests and, um, and so under understanding what those things are and making sure that we're we're communicating in that way. Um, I also think that we aren't afraid, we haven't been afraid 
um, to be, you know, pushed or challenged and saying like, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Um, you know, we had the opportunity, Julie alluded to it, um, to become home to a body of work that is now the Black Principles Network. Um, and that came directly from Schusterman. And I don't think if we had, like, because we had been in conversation and they knew more than just our impact metrics, mm -hmm. they understood like how we work. They understood like our, our culture. And there was an idea that like, Hey, we, we have something that we think fits with you. And I don't know that they would have known that if our only sort of communication and interaction with them had been our sort of formal requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, that I'm, I'm saying a lot about communication but I think recognizing the humanity of your funder and building connection beyond just what is required is something that has absolutely been critical um, with a number of my funding partners. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would just probably just add one thing, which is uh, to Kamita's point, like we are invested in Surge's success. So I appreciate it when Carmita says, hey, I'm having a conversation with X funder. Do you know them? Do you have any guidance around them? Maybe you could reach out to them. Like that gets me fired up, gives me something very specific to do. And it re-engages me because every time, let's be honest, every time I talk to another funder and I say, Carmita and Surge are the best thing ever and you should fund them and here's why. That's also like reinforcing my commitment to Surge. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's not being that's, afraid to ask is a huge thing. Like, okay, so on that point, my next question is: as a smaller nonprofit looking to expand nationally, how do you get a warm introduction to someone at Schusterman? <laughs> They're making the ask. <laughs> well, first, the first thing you do is scour your network. So yeah. I didn't know, well, frankly, I didn't know that I knew anyone at Schusterman. I just happened to, you know, have two board members who had relationships, but I wouldn't have known that if I didn't put out an ask to say, hey, here's the top five funders that I think would, I would love to be in our sort of first round of funding. Do you all know anyone there? Can you make any introductions on my behalf? So just making the ask um, and casting a really wide net. You would you would be surprised who in your network has connections to someone because they went to school together or their mm -hmm. kids are in daycare to get like I've had warm connections made in places that I you know, the, just really unusual suspects. So I, I would say to the person that asking that question, like you really have to start with your network and not be afraid to say exactly what it is that you want. Um, I say to other founders all the time, I don't think people ask me enough. I tell people all the time, I'm an open book, like, let me know how I can help you. And not enough people will take me up on it um, because I think people are so used to these transactional relationships and folks saying stuff they don't mean. But I'm like, if I say it, I really mean it. Like I will on your behalf support you in those ways. So that that would be my uh, my advice to, to that question. So can I make an ask? Can they connect with you on LinkedIn? They, whoever that is, <laughs> reach out to me. Now okay. here's the thing. I got to talk to you first because I'm not going to waste Julie's time. So this is no. the thing. Like I, you I know, understand. I have definitely had people who I don't know reach out and ask me to make a connection. And I'm like, if I don't know you, I'm not, gonna, <laughs> I'm not actually going to then make an introduction. But if we build a connection, I understand more about what you're doing. Then I can make a connection that actually feels genuine because right. it's about something I really believe in. Versus this transactional, hey, we just know each other on LinkedIn. I don't do the transactional. Sure. Um, it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I, I I agree with you on that. Um, LinkedIn, though, does help you to surface where the connections are. Like you were talking about, if yeah. they went to the same school and things like that. So it's a tool that can help to facilitate that. But cold calling without having, a, it just isn't a good, it's, that's not a good way to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so Julie, this is for you. Um, if we see a strong fit between our nonprofit and a foundation, how do we best get around the we don't accept unsolicited proposals? This is interesting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think it goes back to what Carmita was saying, was finding a connection. And like our website lists all of our grantees, not just in the education portfolio, because to Carmita's point, 
the the connections can come from any there my peers my colleagues across the, uh, the other co-presidents as well as just other people on the program teams might just say hey so and so reached out that knows so and so at this organization would you be willing to take a call when it's a warm introduction i try like crazy especially when it's a leader of color i'll just name it i try like crazy to make uh, to make time for that call in a short amount of time um so I think really trying to figure out what's that, that is going to be the way through is a, is some type of a, an outreach. Okay. Sounds great. And Carmita, anything to add to that? Or are we good? I think that's great. Okay. So we're, I can't believe we're like wrapping up, but I really want <laughs> you to just share one amazing piece of advice that you want low pe folks to, to leave with that they can, you know, action on immediately. If we can, we could do that. That'd be wonderful. Just, What's that one thing like, hey, do this or consider doing this? Can I cheat and say two? Oh, sure. Okay. So I would say one for any founder. I mean, this is true for any human being, but particularly for a founder, um, self-awareness is key. And as a founder, I would say um, be really clear about what you do very well and what is the highest and best use of your time and then over invest in those things that are your weakest. Um, that absolutely paid dividends for me. I mentioned earlier, like I am a great communicator. I am horrible at marketing. For the first year and a half of Surge's existence, I paid the marketing person much more than I paid myself because I knew I needed Surge to look like an experience in order for people to feel it. So that's a thing that I would absolutely say. Um, another is invest in, and this, is the, this is the bias of the engineer in me, I'm just going to say this, but invest in evaluation early yeah. and often because yes. in too many relationships, evaluation and research becomes funder driven. Yeah. They don't know more about your work than you do. So start by thinking about how will I know that I am having the desired impact that I want to have? That's not just activity. That's about like what happens because of that. And I will say it is absolutely instilled so much confidence in our funders that no one has ever had to tell us to do that. Like we have had an evaluation plan since day one, and it's been around the things that we know are going to signal the desired impact and outcomes of our work. So those are the two things that I think often get overlooked, but are so yeah. invaluable, particularly at the startup phase of an organization. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for me to now, Julie. Um, I think there's some funder philanthropists here, right? Is that in the audience? Yes. yes. So let me just say, let me talk, like pivot and talk to those folks. So I think our tendency is to hoard information and it comes from a place of not wanting to disappoint. It comes from a place of wanting to like show that we've got the stuff together that we can, we're able to like have answers and know what we're doing. And I just think to Carmita's point, show our human side, right? It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I'm learning about this, right? It's okay to um, to just be that authentic person that we all are. Um, and then to also see that in the per person across the table from us, because we're all kind of like, if this stuff was easy, it would have been solved by now. And I think that's what? true on philanthropy side and nonprofit and all the social justice issues that we're taking on. And Lord knows everybody is showing up today and spending an hour because we care deeply about something that we think will make the world a better place. So we have to see ourselves as partners, but part of that is our bring vulnerability to that conversation as well. Thank you so much. Um, we, um, I, wow, thank you. I want to sincerely thank the two of you, Carmita and Julie, for sharing your insights and experiences with us uh, today. Uh, I could keep talking. I, I wish this was like a whole day thing. <laughs> the story of uh, founding partnership between Surge Institute and the Schusterman Philanth Family Philanthropies demonstrates the power of collaboration and trust between nonprofit leaders and funders by being open, transparent, and willing to take a leap of faith on one another. Um, Carmita and Julie built something truly impactful as we heard today. Their advice on getting new organizations off the ground and providing critical seed funding would no doubt uh, resonate with many of us. And so I think many of us got a lot of value from that. So partnerships like this showcase our sector at its best, right? Um, and when we lead with purpose, passion, and care for community, 
the change we can create together is limitless. Um, thank you all for joining us on this journey today. It's been an honor learning from these inspiring leaders. Uh, and please note that links about how to access the recording of this webinar and to learn about up in, up, um, upcoming events are being shared in the chat. And I think they already have been. And thank you to the Center for Global Affairs at New York University and NYU SPS and Aperio Philanthropy for co-convening this important conversation. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Well, thank you.